Learn the most advanced recruiting techniques. Land the most desirable talent. Launch your company towards massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. All right, well, we've all done it. We've hired the person to look great on paper because they seem to possess the skills we needed, only to have that hire turn out to be a major disaster. So here's the truth. Technical resources have a high failure rate because of how they are interviewed. Now, I'm going to argue that assumptions and expectations alignment are where we fail. It's about how to evaluate and hire strong technical talent by uncovering the truth. Today's quote, talent without discipline is like an octopus on roller skates. There's plenty of movement, but you never know if it's going to be forward, backward, or sideways. Any idea who said that, Mr. Aaron Cooley? Uh, H. Jackson Brown Jr. H. Yeah. Jackson Brown Jr., who, like you just educated me, who is he? Yeah, so he is an author, more my parents' generation than mine. But uh, if you've ever heard of the book, P.S. I Love You, or the book Life's Little Instruction Book, I think that's what it's called. Now he's the author of that. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Good guy. Yay. I'm Rick Gerard, and welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. Our mission is to help entrepreneurs and hiring managers avoid costly hiring mistakes by identifying a specific problem and providing proven tactical solutions to help you win the right hire. We share insights from top performing rebel entrepreneurs, disruptors, and industry experts like our guest today, Mr. Aaron Cooley. Aaron is a lead consultant for security and mobility for a company called Kanai. Aaron has been a technical consultant with them for quite a few years. His specialties include high security backend applications, mobile applications, and applications that leverage video. Over his nearly 30-year career in the Silicon Valley, and by the way, he came down from the Valley. Thank you for joining us. He's uh, worked at companies both large and small to build teams and deliver everything from the first Java-enabled handset to Yahoo's video player, to secure data processing to the world's largest accounting firms. So Aaron's hired hundreds of engineers throughout his career, which makes Aaron the perfect guest for today's topic. Aaron, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show today. Thanks, man. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to have you. So today we are going to cover a few things. We're going to talk about how to identify and evaluate strong technical talent. And then we're going to talk about how to interview so that you can hire the right person that your company needs. So let's dive right into it. Let's talk about let's, the obvious question, which is why do we fail on hiring technical talent? I think the biggest failure has to do with how we conduct the interview. I mean, we don't follow the rules. And for some reason, we seem to break the rules more with technical people than we do when we're hiring somebody for a management position. The rule that you've stated over and over again on your show is that it's about what you've done in the past. That's the best predictor of what you've done in the future. So you want to focus on what has the person done? What have they done in the past? And that's really the best predictor of what they're going to do in the future, not some quiz. The, yeah. the, the biggest problem we have is, and I think it's a common problem, there's, there's sort of two parts to an interview. There's a part where you very much need you and what you're about and your ego in the room. And that's when you're trying to sell the position to the candidate, because that's definitely half the job. We all know that, right? you got to get the other person excited about it. Yep. But the problem is that if that bleeds into the second part of the interview, then you get into trouble because then the second part of the interview becomes about you and not about the person you're trying to hire. And that half of the interview has to be 100% about the candidate. So, I almost feel like the interview needs to be 100% about the candidate today more so than ever. Sure. If your deepest concern is trying to figure out, you, you've got a very limited amount of time. In this industry, we don't have the ability to trial hire people or have them come in. and Or you know, contract to hire. Yeah. And that, I mean, there's... There's just not enough technical talent out there, and the demand is so high. Yeah, yeah. You just can't do it. It's not practical. So you have a limited amount of time. You have maybe five or six hours, if you're lucky, to figure out whether this person is going to be a great hire or not. And you need to spend that time talking about them, trying to figure out what they're doing, and not asking them to do things that say more about you than them. So where are we failing? We're failing in a couple different areas, right? Probably assumptions that you're making based on a resume, When you're non-technical and you're trying to interview and hire a technical person, you don't know what kind of questions to ask. You can't suss out somebody's technical ability. Yeah, you can't figure out whether or not somebody can code 
so the, the analogy I come up with, the, the mistake that we make all the time is we try and do some kind of test, some kind of coding test to figure out whether or not this person can code or can do things that are technical, rather than looking at all of the evidence that's there in their resume and trying to ask them questions about, hey, you worked at this company. What did you do on this project? Okay, they'll tell you what the project is about, but then you need to just keep going back to what did you do? What did personally, what did you do? What, what yeah, is you your really day like? You really have to keep people on you, point. You have to keep people on point. You have to keep digging in. You have to keep trying to ask and suss out specifically what this person did in the past. And the trap we fall into, which brings our ego into the room or into the phone call, is do you know what I know? That's a game that gets played a lot, and it's the, the biggest example of this is the coding quiz. So that's usually when you have a technical person giving an interview to another technical person. Right. 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 They tend to ask them questions that try to, and look, I'm guilty. I've hired a lot of people, and I made this mistake at the beginning. And at one point at a company that I was working for, it just dawned on me that maybe this wasn't working. I mean, I hired somebody based on whether or not they were able to pass the the technical interviews, uh, and they just didn't turn out to be the person that I thought they were going to be. Um, it's kind of like somebody in school who's a really good test taker, but they fail miserably at life, right? Like they can't really tie their shoes or balance their checkbook. Sure. Uh, the best analogy I've come up with is this. Let's say that you're, and hopefully this will resonate for everyone else that's non-technical because, you know, describing how a technical interview works is, is too complicated for non-technical people, but it's like I'm a studio musician and I've played for a bunch of big bands. I played for Led Zeppelin back in the seventies. And then, you know, I, I worked with Millie Cyrus on her you album. The, you have the hair for it. So right. Yeah. I know I do. <laughs> and, and I have like a long resume and, you know, I'm interviewing for a position to play backup guitar in a big band or something like that, help somebody with their album. And the goal of the interview is to try and figure out whether or not I can play guitar because they want to know whether or not I can work with a band, but they also want to make sure I can play guitar. So rather than ask what I actually did on all these other obvious things that I've worked on and use that to decide whether or not I'm going to work in this album, I come in and the stagehand comes up from the basement with a ukulele, hands me the ukulele and says, Camp Town Ladies, go. And I take the ukulele <laughs> and I'm like, Camp town ladies all night long. Do da do da. I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the second verse and trying to figure it out on the ukulele, but I don't really play ukulele. And then that stagehand goes back to the you know the hiring manager and says, "Well, I can bust out Camp Town Ladies no problem at my desk. I do it every day." And this guy couldn't really get the chords right. I didn't like his fingering technique. And I, that's just ridiculous. You, yeah. you can't do that. It's bad in two ways. One way is you really didn't find out anything. And you had all of this information. You could have asked all these questions about what have you done in the past. You could have asked the technical resource if they had any open source they were willing to walk you through anything they'd done, some code they could share, anything. There's all kinds of ways you can approach this problem of trying to figure out what this person's technical skills are, and you just didn't do it. You wasted your time. They tried to play Camp Town Ladies. The, the coding equivalent is I open up my laptop, or worse yet, I write on a whiteboard, and I'm trying to code, demonstrate that I can code by writing code on a whiteboard, well, maybe a in a language times I don't code, know. Yeah, a yeah. lot of times, I was going to say that, a lot of times it's a language that you're not super familiar with, or yeah. they're asking you to do something that you did back in college, but, you know, yeah. 10 years in, you, you wouldn't Camp, even use Camp that. Camp Town anymore. Ladies. Everyone yeah. knows Camp Town Ladies, right? Not no, everyone knows I know Camp Chopsticks Town on the yeah, piano. Exactly. That's really it. And that's, that's kind of the game of, do you know what I know, yeah. right? So you're asking them to do something that the person interviewing knows very well and could easily do, but the other person, they're not necessarily versed in exactly what the coding quiz was. And if they were, it would be too simple. So just skip it. Just don't even do it. You know, it's interesting. So non-technical founders who are trying to find a technical person, I run into this quite often, where they, again, this, this point still holds really strong. You want to evaluate what the person's done or what impact they've made as opposed to being enamored by where they worked on the resume or the skills section where they have eight years of this and five years of that, because right. that doesn't tell whether or not somebody's good. So I think if you're non-technical, there's definitely value in bringing a technical person into the interview. 
but the process is still the same. You still want to follow the same process that you would follow if you were interviewing a management person, which is you totally. want to dig into what they did. You want to have that technical person in the room who can say like, yeah, okay, this thing that this person did is super related to the things that we're trying to do in this company, or no, that's not really related, or it sounds like this person worked more on this and less of that. They were more about leading the team than actually writing the code, or they were way down so deep having in the a code. technical advisor right. is, is key. You, you want to have somebody technical in the room that understands all the answers to the questions that you're asking as you dig in. And you really want to go through that resume and ask them for every job, for every technical job they have, and take your time. What did you do? Exactly what was the day-to-day -day like? What happened with the project? What were the stages? What did you learn? What were your key takeaways? And, and exactly what code did you write? What did you work on every day? The other trap we fall into is the alphabet. I call it the alphabet soup trap. The alphabet soup on my resume is that section at the top that has a bunch of acronyms. Yeah. Job, job is not buzzwords. an acronym, but it has all the buzzwords for all the different stacks I know, et cetera, et cetera. I call it the buzzword and bullshit yeah. section. Yeah. So that has some importance, especially if you're hiring a more junior resource and you really need to bring somebody in to hit the ground running. You definitely don't want to hire somebody that's going to take three weeks to come up to speed. But if you're hiring a more senior resource or you're hiring somebody and there is time for them to ramp up, then it almost doesn't matter what they know. If they know something similar, it's fine. As long but as they have that's experience. Where I, I find that that's where most companies get trapped in the false positive. Yeah. Is the buzzword soup. That's yeah, yeah, put in there, yeah, yeah. Right? Because you have to optimize. If you're, if you're applying to a job, right, you have to optimize your resume so you can get the interview. Sure. As we all know, because everybody's interviewed people and they get down to that. Well, it says you have job experience, but... Tell me about your job experience and you get into it and they don't really have that experience. Right, right, right. right. You know, oh, I, I took a class in college. Like, yeah. what have you built in Java? Nothing. Yeah, yeah. But they have it on the resume and they could claim they did it for two years, you know? So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of false positives that fall through the cracks there. And then you have the false negatives where there's a lot of good people that don't write buzzword heavy resumes. Right. They'll actually say the projects they worked on, but they don't buzzword it up. Yeah. And they fall through the cracks. Sometimes uh, somebody's not able to to look beyond what. Yeah. The simple the simple buzzwords to that, read between the right. lines. Yeah. I think you know knowing a technology stack before you enter a project, it definitely has some advantages. But I don't I don't put too much weight on it. So uh, let's I'll give you a concrete example. But how hard though is it? For a really good, somebody who's just a good coder to pick up a different language it's, and run with it. It's not hard. If it's something that they completely don't know anything about, I've always written client-side code, I've always focused on the front end, and I've never focused on a back end, then there's definitely a, a big learning a curve. steep learning curve to, you know, if you if that's your primary goal is to write back end stuff and you hire a guy that only knows front end, expect some pain along the way as they sort a of lot learn. Of pain. <laughs> yeah. As they learn the pitfalls of how to write back end code. But look, if you're hiring somebody to write in one backend language and you find an excellent candidate with all the experience that uh, you need except for that one language, but they have the other backend experience delivering projects, delivering projects maybe in the space that you're interested in, maybe some specialization and some related technologies, then that's fine. A new language is easy to pick up. A whole new discipline, like going from backend coding to frontend coding, that's a little more where you need experience. And there are plenty of people that can learn other disciplines. That's easy to pick up too. You just have to realize, you have to factor in what, you know, how much time it's going to take them. So again, this is where you need to bring a technical resource yeah. into the room, right? Yeah. And say like, okay, how much of what we need done is based on the specific language that we're asking for? And how much of it is knowing the kind of thing that we're building? So mobile is a kind of thing iOS or Android, those are coding skills. But if you have 10 years of experience building Android applications to ask you to learn how to build an iOS application, that's like a two or three week thing. There might be a few pitfalls, but mostly the pitfalls are about mobile in general and not about... Is it really hard to like iOS. learn the nuances of some of those things? I mean, is it going to put you that far behind? It, it's not going to put you that far behind. Okay. And the other thing that we have that people forget about is the internet. I use it all the time as a consultant. Google.com, right? <laughs> yeah. If there's if I run into a problem, I'm probably not the only one. I know we all like to think that we're special and unique snowflakes as we code and that we're 
charting the unsailed seas, but most of the time somebody's been there before. And if I run into a problem, I can figure out the answer. Entrepreneurs get stuck a lot of times is they'll, they'll get enamored by somebody working in that space. And so they want to try and hire somebody who's done the exact job that they need them to do. Right. A lot of times somebody's leaving a job because they don't want to do that job anymore. But if you're hiring them to do the same job they've been doing just yep. at a different place, the only thing that you really have for them is more money. This gets into the other thing that I think is really important, which is desire. So uh, the example I give is I had a bunch of candidates come to me and interview for a position. It was a fairly straightforward position. All the candidates had the same level of experience. It was for doing uh, database management and an IT function. And one of the candidates... As I was walking her out the door, she didn't have the same level of background that the other two candidates did. But she stopped me in the hallway and she said, look, I really, really want this job. I really want it. I want it really bad. This company that you're working with is super interesting. And I want this job. I gave her the job. and Did you regret it? Yeah, no, I didn't regret it at all. So I think, she crushed it. Huh? Yeah, she she really crushed it. And I've had that experience over and over again. I hired somebody else at a consulting firm I used to work for who was young and didn't have that much experience doing mobile work. And we were mostly fo focused on mobile at the time. And she crushed it. She went in by herself and learned how to code in iOS, self-taught, delivered to the customer. The customer was ecstatic. That happens over and over again. If somebody has a strong desire, that almost outweighs everything else. I totally agree with you 100%. All right, you're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Gerard. And for our podcast listeners, we're going to take a quick educational moment from our sponsors. Find out how healing a person's pain points attracts amazing people to your company. Check out our passive talent webinar at stridesearch.com. We're talking to Aaron Cooley, who is a lead consultant in security and mobility for Kunai. And we're talking about proper evaluation of technical talent. We just talked a little bit about what to look for. Now let's talk a little bit about what to avoid. And then let's get into the how-to because that's the fun part. Just give me a quick breakdown of what companies should really make sure they avoid in this interview process. So the one thing I like to caution people, especially when you're hiring a senior technical person, is that there are two kinds of architects. There's the kind of architect that writes code. For myself, I write code every day. For myself, I generally avoid the label architect because what that generally means is actually technical product ownership. So there's a difference between the two. If you're an architect, like the kind of architect that I am, you're really not an architect. You're a senior technical engineer. You write code every day. You know how to come up with a, a new architecture for a new product, but you really understand how to build things, how to make them go. And if that's what you're trying to hire, you're trying to hire somebody technical to run your engineering team, to lead your technical teams to deliver a product, then that's the person you need to look for. They need to be hands-on. I understand they're tough to find, but man, if you have to grow one, like if you were looking for somebody with 10 years experience or 20 years experience, you're not going to find too many. You're right. There aren't too many of us left. We tend to get pushed into the other roles, into the management roles, into the other architecture role, which I'll talk about in a second, into the product role. Yeah. After 20 years, there aren't that many of us left. Can you take yeah. a senior engineer and move them into that role? You can. And that's what I was going to suggest next. Yeah, one. Right. So better to grow somebody into that role through coaching them, through helping them lead the team, through twisting their arm to get them to write documentation, through, you know, beating them over the head to get them to help write the things that you need, user stories and other things to help the other engineers. Better to do that than to hire an architect who hasn't coded in five or 10 years to try and lead your technical development. The problem with guys that have moved over onto the more traditional architecture side is they no longer actually write the code and their technical abilities go stale. That's actually, I actually think that's okay. In a big company, you definitely need technical product owners, which is what they really are. They understand from a technical perspective what the customer is going to get, what the customer of your product is going to get might be very technical. And so you might need an architect to draw pictures to explain how your API works or to explain how your very technical product works. Those guys are great for that. But let's let's be clear, that's what they are, right? They are technical product owners. They no longer code. So they really shouldn't be responsible for saying how things should be coded. 
Yeah. Yeah. If you're building a race car, this guy's got to be able to drive it and work on and the engine fix too. It. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we're going to avoid, uh, do you know what I know? We're going to avoid coding quizzes and then do not hire an architect that doesn't write code. Yeah. It's got to be hands-on. Now, by the time you get to 100 people, that CTO role is going to change. Oh, yeah, totally. Then you want somebody with an MBA because it's a management role. The rule I use, simple rule, and I, I was taught this way back in my days at Sun Microsystems. If you have 14 people reporting to you, you are a manager. That's all you do. 14. Yeah. That's the key number. That's the key number. That was the key number at Sun. If you've got seven, you might have some time to do something besides keep track of all your employees and what they're doing. But at 14, forget it, you're a manager. So you got 14 people underneath you. That's it. You no longer write code. <laughs> so you keep your team at 13? Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can manage seven people. They got to be pretty senior. And as you go down, so if you have a company that has, you know, 10 people total, then the CTO probably has, what, four or five people reporting to them. That means that person should probably be writing code. If not, you're wasting a, a lot of headcount on somebody that's not managing that many people. I mean, look, if you grow up to, to be a company of 30 people, then you have the right person. But at 10 people, that person's got to write code. All right. So let's talk about fixing this. We're going to start with the resume. As I'm getting people that I want to bring into my process to interview, what should I be looking for? Man, do your research. Do not be lazy. As a technical person, I do my but research. But I found them off Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> or some recruiters sent me people. People have like a digital footprint these days, right? So if you've got my resume, you've also got my LinkedIn profile. And my LinkedIn profile, I can see how it's connected to your LinkedIn profile. So try to do your research, figure out who's connected to this person that you know, try to poke around and find out as much as you can. Then when you bring them in for the interview, same as you would do with any other candidate, you go through that entire history. What did you do at this job? Who was your manager? You might even want to start asking names, right? Who were who the other people reporting to you? Yeah, don't shortcut it. Yeah. And when you go for references, you can do the same thing that you would do with a management position, with a technical person, ask them if they were a technical leader, say like, okay, I, I want one of your peers as a reference. I want your manager as a reference too. But what are you looking for on the resume that helps you determine whether or not you want to talk to somebody? What am I looking for on the resume? Same thing you would look for on any other resume. Is it a fit? Have they done things in the past that look like the things that you want to do in the future? And by things, I mean, think more about what's really important at your company. Think less about the alphabet soup. What's important to your business. Yeah. And more about, did they do the thing that delivered something? So if my resume says that I was in an IT role at a big company and you want to hire somebody in your startup, to do something developing a, a new cloud-based infrastructure, maybe that's a match, but probably not. You probably want to see that I've developed other cloud backend infrastructure, right? Yeah. If you're looking at somebody who is in IT and did mobile and you're hiring for a backend cloud AI infrastructure, you know, that's not such a good match. Yeah, and the worst thing you do is take a referral from a friend who's got a friend who's out of work and looking for a job who's a software engineer. <laughs> Yeah. You really want to test it. Yeah, you want to test those. But look, 75% of your connections are not going to come through a recruiter. Sorry, Rick. They're going to come through an internal No, referral. they're going to come through referrals. Yeah. And as they should in the beginning, you should work your referral base first. Yeah. But and, you, if you, and if you exhaust them, then come to me or yeah. somebody else who has connections in that area. Yeah. But this goes back to what I was saying before. When you get a referral, one of the great things about it is you might know something about that person. If it's a friend of a friend and he's out of work and blah, 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 then treat that like any other resume that hits your desk. Vet people properly. Yeah. And if it's somebody that works with you that says that I know somebody who'd be a perfect match for this job and I know his background experience and I know what he's done in the past, that's not everything. You still need to interview this person. But at least you've got some information. You've got more information than you would get with a regular resume. All right. So I'm going to I'm gonna throw in one thing. The most underutilized tool is the phone screen. You can suss out a lot of really good content and a lot of this information in a phone screen rather than bringing somebody in for an interview. I agree. Or meeting them for coffee. For I agree. That fact. But I would caution you in the phone screen. Make sure you check your ego at the door. Yes. 
it's not actually the phone screen is not about you. So you shouldn't sell it all. Right. You should use the phone screen as an opportunity to learn about that person. Exactly. And understand who they are as a person first and whether or not they align with your company goals. Yep. And if they align there, then great. Now you can move them forward. The key to the phone screen is don't tell them about your company first. Right. Find out about them. Let them make that conversation about them. People love to talk about themselves. So let them. Yeah. Let them talk about themselves. Yeah, they'll they'll yeah. tell you everything that you need to know because once you start feeding them information about your company, then they start tailoring their answers right. toward what they think that you want. The one place I would caution you with technical resources is, again, avoid quizzes. Don't ask right. them questions that you know the answer to. Ask them to talk about themselves. So the question of you're the size of a nickel and you fall into a blender, how do you get out? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Not good. That's not a good question. Exactly. Yeah, good Why question. are manhole covers round was the famous Microsoft Oh, well, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I got asked the question at Google. I didn't know the answer to. I actually knew the answer. I couldn't exactly describe the algorithm during the interview. And someone at Google said, I'm sorry, you can never code at Google. Boy, that, that just offended me. <laughs> that's That's been a thorn in my side for a long time. And they've completely changed the practice. As they grew as a company, they realized, look, we're just losing a lot of great talent totally. by, by doing things this way. Totally. So what should we do exactly in the interview process? They've made it for, through my phone screen. I bring them in. What do you do to walk somebody through what they've accomplished? What I they've go done? from most recent to oldest because it's the most relevant experience is your most recent experience. But I try to get through the entire resume. Really? Yeah. If it's a technical person, maybe I'll let them skip around and talk about the things that they're most proud of. But I think it's important that you lead it, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I start at the top of the resume. Okay. So walk me through your current project. Yeah, yeah. Walk me through your current project. And again, the most important thing is it's just human nature. Yeah. We're going to talk about the project because that's what I just asked you. And what you're really trying to find out is what did you do what on the project? Specifically you. Right. Not what? your team. Right. What you did. Right. And a lot of a lot of engineers will t start to tell you, oh, well, we did this, we did that. Yeah, yeah. But what did you, you're yeah, going to yeah. have to keep bringing it around yeah, you, to that. Yeah, you got to keep bringing it back. Like, I get what was you, your piece. Right. And I, I know you're trying to be humble here, but don't be humble. Yeah. Tell me exactly what you did. What problem did you solve? What did you do? Because you really want to know what is this person good at. And eventually, as you go through the different job positions, you're going to see a pattern. If you want to make sure that, you know, they're telling you the truth on everything about what they did, then you want Poke to ask. Holes in it. Yeah. You, you want to ask questions. You want to try to ask them more. You also want to ask. Like, how did you do it? Yeah. So when they tell you something, you go into, okay, well, how did you do it? Explain that to me. Or yep. what, how did that work? And you can ask for references too, right? You yeah. can ask for specific references for specific positions. Most of the time, they give you references of people who are going to give them a good reference, right? right? So do you ask specifically just for managers and managers only? No, no, no. I definitely ask for, especially if you're hiring a senior engineer, you want peers and direct reports. It's sort of complicated. You as the candidate can't always get exactly the reference that the interviewer wants, but try to work with them. Let them understand like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to ask this person a few questions. I'm just going to, I'm not going to ask them, are you good or bad? I'm, I'm really just going to ask them about what you did. Or rate your experience with this. Yeah, because that's just Those are all silly opinions. things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's really silly. And on a scale from one to five, how do you rate yourself yeah. on Java? It's the worst question ever. No, no. So what I try to do with the reference is make sure that it aligns with the story that the person told me. So if they said they worked on this and they did these things and they this was their daily stuff, then I go back to the reference and say, okay, so this person told me that they worked on these things. and That's perfect. Yeah. That's a, that's a good way to utilize references yeah. for sure. All right, we're getting close on time. Three key things I could do to make we'll sure go, they do. We'll go back to the top three. Okay. First one is skip the coding quiz. Make sure you go with their experience and what they've mm -hmm. done before. Not, do you know what I know? Past performance is a key indicator of future performance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I say it all the time. The second one was, especially for an, a small company, make sure you're hiring somebody that's a fit for a position in terms of their actual technical experience. Don't hire a non-coding architect if you've got a small company and you need somebody to lead your other more junior technical engineers into the future. They got to write code. Yep. Lastly, dig deep and go based on experience. I mean, that goes with my first one. Don't quiz them. But really, that's what you want it to be about is what they've done before. That's the best predictor of the future. All right. Well, we're just about out of time for today's show. Aaron, thanks so much for your time, Investment Day. And I want to welcome you to the Higher Power Radio community. 
a little bit about your firm. Uh, what would be the best way in which uh, members of our community can reach you and what services do you offer? So it's K-U-N-A-I, K-U-N-A-I Consulting.com or K-U-N.A-I. Or K-U-N.A-I. Yep. Perfect. You can reach out uh, on our website. You can find us. Uh, you can reach me, Aaron, at KanaiConsulting.com. So I want to thank our listening audience for tuning in to this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, our engineer, Paul Roberts, our producers, Andrea Ballin, Shanti Ryle, and our creative director, Ayla Gerard. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, review, and share. We're listening. We welcome your feedback. After all the shows for you, join the Higher Power Radio community at Higher, that's H I R E, Power, P O W E R, Radio, R A D I O dot com. And you can drop me an email at rickatstridesearch.com. Tune in next week. Our guest is going to be Michael Goldberg. He's the founder and CEO of Hiring Transformed. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Woo. Thank you for listening to Higher Power with Rick Gerard on OC Talk Radio.